Hello there. My name is Dr. Anton Jessup, curator of monster studies here at the university. The recent Knox Automill crisis has allowed me to reclaim my old classroom, but the resulting unrest has also permitted many an unnatural creature to roam free, some of whom have a rather subversive agenda. A number of my students have asked me, Dr. Jessup, why are there six-foot bean pods in the school cafeteria? Why is there a man-sized block of ice in the shop room? And Dr. Jessup, can my mysterious double, the one with the bleeding eyes, take my final exam for me? The answers are, respectively, budget cuts, labor shortages, and why you are the one with the bleeding eyes, my darling. Ah, but this line of questioning underlies a far deeper concern. What should we do about alien shapeshifters in our midst? What can we do? Pod people, the puppet masters, the thing. Yes, we humans have much to fear, for at any moment one of these imposter alien species could creep in and replace our loved ones, our politicians, or other influential members of society. All we can do is look out for number one, murder our doppelgangers and hope they don't catch on to our suspicions. Because surely they'll only masquerade so far as is necessary. Surely, once they've reached the tipping point of infiltration, no longer endangered by human backlash, they'll abandon their false forms and usher us all into labor camps, or simply absorb our delicious biomass into one vast, oozing, orgasmic feast of the new flesh. Or, you know, something to that effect, if, if anyone out there happens to know any alien flesh-merging swingers. Never mind, never mind. Look, look, you can fight the face dancers and the skin spies all you like, but maybe your fear of total assimilation is ungrounded. Because if the natural world teaches us anything, it's that the doppelgangers in our midst crave not domination, but equilibrium. Take the thing, for example. It waged a full-blown campaign of absorption at the Antarctic research stations. But perhaps this was only to gain entry into a larger population, a population capable of supporting it and protecting it. In this, it has much in common with the parasitic beetle, Passus faviri. As detailed in a 2015 study published in PLOS-1, the P. faviri beetle makes its home inside an ant colony a heavily guarded, near impenetrable fortress rich with bountiful resources. It's a dangerous place for outsiders, but a host of specialized invertebrates known as myrmecophiles or ant lovers evolved to trick the ant population into accepting or overlooking their intrusion. P. Faviri seems to achieve this through a complex dance of both chemical and auditory mimicry, convincing the ant population that it's one of them. Even as it feeds on their lava and benefits from the colony's protection. As recently replaced science journalist Carl Zimmer highlights in a New York Times piece on the study, the deceptive beetle may even mimic the ant queen from time to time in order to receive royal treatment but it otherwise knows to leave Her Royal Highness alone unharmed. It doesn't seek to decimate the host colony, but rather to thrive within through perfect mimicry. Countless other parasites demonstrate this need for balance within a host community. Cowbirds sneak their eggs into the nests of other bird species, but only turn to violent aggression if their designs are thwarted. Many internal parasites only become dire health hazards when the dynamics of parasitic equilibrium are disrupted. And so I urge you to not only tolerate the alien interlopers in our midst, but to secretly embrace them. Don't ask pesky questions about why their armpits smell like lima beans, or that weird purple growth on their neck, or anything about the ever-bleeding depths of their eyes, because they, like you, crave only peace security, and maybe a little help repairing their crashed warship. But I think that makes them job creators, don't you? All right, class, do we have any questions? Yes. Will this be on the final? Most definitely. Keep watching the skies and in transmission.
Welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen, here with Dr. Manfred Leach. Can you explain Noxotomil? It was regulated for years by the FDA, now all of a sudden in our water supply? Well, of course, Noxotomil is a drug that does not come without its challenges. Noxotomil offers great rewards, but of course with great rewards there are always risks. This is to be expected. And 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 and